to meeting you.
Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome. I'm glad you're here today. Those of you that are joining us here in person and those of you that are joining us online, this is gonna be a good day today. Let me ask you a question. How many of you could use more strength in your life? You just feel like most of us could, right? Do you know the Bible says in Nehemiah that the joy of the Lord is your strength? And it also says that there is joy in the house of the Lord. And so today we're gonna experience that joy and you're gonna get some more strength, amen? Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for the opportunity we have to join together today as part of the body of Christ. We thank you for the promise of your word that as we come together like this, that you are here among us. So Lord, we acknowledge you. And God, we ask that you would have your way in our hearts and in this service today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship the Lord together. Today, and we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place, and we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place, and we won't be quiet. Quiet. 
thank you that the joy of the Lord is our strength. God, this morning we bow before you. We surrender before you. And we ask you to come and move in this place and in our hearts, God. Would you remind us that you have everything we need, that you sustain us, God, we look to you this morning for peace, for wisdom and direction. Would you remind us of who you are this morning as we come before you and we lay aside every distraction?
thank you, Jesus, for your love and your mercy that is new every morning. Amen. Well, right now we're gonna go ahead and let our elementary aged children head out with Pastor Eastman and his team. They're gonna have an awesome time in Redeemer Kids and then they will bring them back to you after Pastor Sean's message so that you can take communion together as a family. Before you take your seat, would you take a second and say good morning to somebody around you? Good morning, everyone. Good morning, welcome to Redeemer. We're so glad that you're here with us to worship today. Man, after that time of worship together, I hope that your heart just feels stirred up and ready to receive the word of God in just a few minutes. Hey, look at your neighbor, say, I hope you're ready. Pastor Sean has an incredible word for us in just a moment. But first, I wanna welcome you. If you're a guest this morning, can we just take a minute to welcome our guests together? We're so glad that you're here. Welcome to Redeemer. If you're online, we're so glad that you're joining us online. If you are a guest and you're on campus, would you take just a moment to pull out the Connect card that you'll see in the seat back pocket in front of you? If you'll fill that out for us during the service, then on your way out, straight out these center doors, you can drop it by the Welcome Center. It just makes it so easy for our team to connect with you and meet you and share more about the church. So drop that Connect card out there for us. If you're online, you can click Connect. It just dropped in the chat and it's also at the top right hand corner of your screen. We're excited to get connected with all of you this morning. There's a couple things coming up that I would love to highlight with you, but just a reminder that the best way to stay in the loop is with the Redeemer Church app on your smartphone. So make sure you take a second to download that today. You can stay up to date with all of the events and exciting things coming up. The first thing begins today, and that is the growth track. This is a three-step membership track. It'll just help you learn more about the mission of our church, what it is that we're dedicated to. You'll hear from Pastor Sean today. He'll be teaching step one. So if you have a few minutes after service, head upstairs. We'll provide the lunch for you. Join us upstairs at 12 o'clock for the growth track step one today. The next thing I want to share about, which I'm really excited for, is our singles ministry that is getting off the ground. In the beginning of 2022, you may remember that Pastor Sean cast vision for us that as a church throughout this year, we were gonna work together to strengthen our family ministries. And we have been so amazed by what God has done in our family ministries. We have seen incredible growth across the board in our family ministries from birth all the way through 12th grade in the lives of kids. But this by no means uh, excludes singles. Singles are a part of our church family and they are just as important to us. So we've been working over the last several months with Karen Wenzel to get a dynamic singles ministry off the ground. And I'm happy to report that it is time next Sunday, August 14th at 12 p.m. Karen will be having a quick meet and greet. And if you're a single, I would love to encourage you to swing by, ask your questions, get your questions answered, hear the vision about this exciting new ministry. I know that Karen is excited and we are too. We have an opportunity this morning to continue and worship together through the giving of our tithes and offerings. And you'll see on the screen multiple secure ways that you can do that. I wanna highlight the QR code. Now, a couple weeks ago, I was sitting in Pastor Sean's message and he shared a QR code on the screen so that we could all get this amazing book that he was talking about. And I watched most of us capture that QR code, worked great, but for some of us, we tried to take a picture of the QR code. And so I just wanted to take 10 seconds to explain how to use a QR code, just in case you're not aware. I know it sounds funny, but you're gonna thank me, okay? So you're gonna pull out your smartphone, point it at the screen. You might have to zoom in a little bit, and then a link is gonna pop up on your camera screen. Click the link and you'll be able to give. Do not take a picture. That's just gonna fill up the storage on your iPhone. We don't wanna do that. As we prepare 
to give our tithes and offerings. It's important to us as a church to take a moment to pray for another church right here in our city. This is just one way that we together as a church stay dedicated to unity. So if you'll join me this morning, we're gonna be praying for Church of Our Savior. It's an Anglican church off of Beach Boulevard. And they have, we reach out to these churches and ask them what they would like us to pray for. And they asked us to pray for their growing children's ministry that more volunteers would step up to serve these kids and to impact their lives for the gospel. They're in need of volunteers from within their own congregation. So we're gonna take a moment to pray over our tithes and our offerings and over Church of Our Savior Anglican. Will you bow your heads with me? Jesus, we are so thankful for this morning. God, we're so thankful for your presence for the way that you met with us in worship. God, we're thankful for what you're about to speak to us through the power of your word. But right now, Lord, we bring before you our tithes and our offerings, and we ask you, Jesus, to bless it, to multiply it, God, to meet the needs of this church and of ministries around the world that we help to support. And Father, we lift up Church of Our Savior, Anglican Church, God Off Beach Boulevard. We just pray your blessing over that church. We pray the favor of God over that church in every way. Lord, we celebrate with them at the growth of their children's ministry. And we now ask you, God, to stir the hearts of those within their family that are called to step forward and to serve in this ministry, God, to meet that growth head on and to impact the lives of children. God, let it be so. Father, we give you the glory and the honor and the praise for all that you're doing in this place and in our church. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray together. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Kathleen. One final announcement I want to let you know about is next Sunday, right after both services, Michael Gunning will be leading a gospel conversation training. It takes about 15 minutes. It's going to be right over in the Redeemer Kids room. So right after service, you can just Go right over there. It'll take about 15 minutes. And this is a very easy, practical training within about 15 minutes for you to learn how to turn any conversation into a gospel conversation and not be weird about it. And so it gives you the tools, it gives you the equipment, it gives you the encouragement. It's a great way to understand how you can share your faith. It's very easy, gospel conversation training next week right across the hall, right after both services with Michael Gunning. So be sure to uh, to join us for that if you can. So for the last few weeks, I've been reviewing our mission statement and our distinctives. And we've commented frequently over the last few weeks that our mission statement is not unlike a lot of church mission statements. Our mission statement is to reach people with the life-giving message of the gospel so that they may become fully devoted followers of Jesus. There are a lot of good messages. There are a lot of good motivational talks. There are a lot of good TED Talks. But there's only one message that can take somebody from death to life, and that's the message of the gospel. Our mission, the reason that we're here, is to reach them with that message so that they can become fully devoted followers of Jesus. And so a lot of churches have a mission statement very similar to that, and they should because Jesus gave us all the same commission. It's the great commission. We're all on this commission together. But churches have different distinctives, things that are unique about them, and it's because of where God has placed them in the body of Christ, what their call and what their giftings are. So we've been talking about our distinctives as a church. What is distinct about Redeemer? That's what we've been going through the last few weeks. Today, I wanna go back to the idea in in our mission statement of being fully devoted. What does that mean? Because see, it's important that you understand if this is your church, it's important that you understand these things so that we're in unity. Because if you don't, you'll fill in with your own assumptions. And that may create misunderstanding, which could also create division. And it's important. And the best way to make sure everybody has the same understanding is to communicate it. Imagine that, communication, how important communication is. Communication is the lifeblood of a relationship. And so I wanna communicate with you what it means to be fully devoted. Before I do, let me use the illustration to further prove why this is so important. I'm gonna say a word, and I want everybody in here to picture the word that I'm saying. And then a few of you can shout out what you picture. Okay, here's the word. I've got something specifically in mind that I want you to picture, and here's what it is. I want everybody in here to picture a dog. Got it? Okay, who, tell me what you pictured. A German shepherd? Ollie? Somebody pictured their, oh, a collie. (laughs) A collie? Okay, well, I gotta tell you, everybody in the first service, there's always one, Doug Naylor, if you know him, this is everything you need to know about Doug Naylor, he pictured Dog the Bounty Hunter. (laughs) This is why communication is so important. But see, what normally happens is 
when we, hear, we, we, we interpret whatever it is through our own experience. Most people, when you say dog, they picture their own dog, which is what we do with most things is we interpret things through our own filter and our own experience. That's why communicating something like this is so important. Now, if I had said, picture a German shepherd with a red collar, wagging his tail and panting, now we're probably all picturing something closer to the same thing, but there's probably still some variation. Right, But that's why communication is so important. So when we say a fully devoted follower of Jesus, what does that mean to you? What are you picturing? What are you thinking of? And it might not be the same thing that we're working towards. And so it's important to define that. So in growth track, and I'm just gonna briefly say this today, what we cover or what are those, there are five things that we consider to be five core characteristics of a follower of Jesus. They're not the only things, but these are five things that we feel are so significant that if this is your church for one day or for one year or for 10 years, we want to see you growing and maturing in these five areas towards becoming a more fully devoted follower of Jesus. The first thing is we're fully devoted to God's word. We cannot get to know God apart from his word. The Bible is the inspired word of God. It's God re God's revelation of himself to mankind, right? So we cannot get to know God apart from his word. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, with God, and the word was God. So the word was God. So I cannot get to know God apart from his word. We're fully devoted to God's word, to reading it, to preaching it, to studying it. We're fully devoted, all of us, no matter where we are in our journey, to grow further in our understanding and our knowledge of the Bible. And so for some of you, that might be doing a devotion. Some might be signing up for a class. For some of you, it might be going to seminary. Whatever it is, we're fully devoted to God's word. The second thing is we're fully devoted to prayer. It's simple. This is not rocket science, but anything that's simple to do is also simple not to do. It's easy to pray. It's also easy to hit snooze. It's easy to pray. It's also easy to scroll through Instagram. You know, instead, get distracted with other things. But prayer is our communication with God. And communication is, is two way. It's, it's talking and listening. It's, that's where relationship happens. You can know somebody, you can actually, you know, be in, fa in a family with somebody, but not really have a relationship because you don't communicate. Prayer is communication. That's why we have Redeemer Healing Prayer. That's why we'll have prayer and fasting times. That's why we'll try to give you resources to help you in your own prayer life and your own prayer journey. It's why we'll have corporate prayer times and why we'll, have, well, we'll, we'll emphasize private prayer times. We're fully devoted to prayer. The third one is, I'm gonna skip over because this is what I really wanna camp out on today, is that we're fully devoted to serving others. As followers of Jesus, as God's family, we're fully devoted to serving others. I'm gonna come back to that in just a moment. The fourth one is that we're fully devoted to generosity. This is not about trying to manipulate you to give money to the church or to tithe. Tithing is what we, that's, that's what we do as Christians. This is about having a lifestyle of being generous. That as, as fully devoted followers of Jesus, I'm generous. I'm generous to the people that are, are in my neighborhood. I'm generous to the people in my family, generous to the people I work with, generous to strangers. That I'm generous with my time. I'm generous with my forgiveness. I'm generous with compassion. I'm generous with resources. That I'm generous because God is generous. We serve a benevolent, generous God. He is giving the very reason we're here. Yeah, that's actually worthy of applause. You see this in his character from Genesis to Revelation. He's generous. How can I follow God? How can I be a disciple of Jesus and not be generous? How can I be a disciple of Jesus and not extend forgiveness to somebody that offended me when God's extended forgiveness to me more times than I could even count? How could I be a follower of Jesus and not be generous with my resources to others when everything that I have, God has given to me? We're fully devoted to generosity. And the, and the fifth one is, we're fully devoted, completely dedicated to the Great Commission. The Great Commission is not an afterthought. It's not like Jesus was about to ascend into heaven and he goes, oh, wait a minute, he comes back down. By the way, just one more thing. Um, if you're not too busy this summer, maybe you could take a couple of weeks and go on a short-term mission trip and you know, see, see how that works out, okay? All right, peace out, you guys, and then up. You know? That's not what happens. The Great Commission is more like, let me make sure you don't miss this. In case you missed everything that I've been saying, and now you understand, you've seen me crucified, dead, and raised from the dead, and you, now you understand all authority is given to me. Therefore, go. Yeah. <laughs> Make disciples of all nations, right? 
And uh, the Great Commission is God's heart from Genesis to Revelation. We're fully devoted to it across the street and around the world. Fully devoted to the Great Commission. Let me go back to this third one. Fully devoted to serving others. Because today we're emphasizing serving and encouraging you, if you're a member here, to get involved on a serve team. Serving somewhere. Uh, Eastman said it like this at the end of the second service. He said, serving Christians are happy Christians. Anybody want to be happy? Of course, I've never seen Eastman not happy. But I've also never seen him not serving. And so it's when you're serving and you're giving, your own gifts get stirred up and you get, make connections with people and you make relationships with people. It's important. Years ago, I was spending time with this great leader named Costa Dier. And Costa had been a, he's from Palestine. He had been a missionary in Africa for over 50 years and he was, an, he was a professor at Elam Bible College up in New York. But he had a house here at Jack's Beach and he would come and write books here and I occasionally got to spend some time with him. And he's about this big bald, pointy ears, and he talked like Yoda. I mean, he was literally like a human Yoda. To me, he was. I was like, he was like a Jedi master, you know? And, uh, but he asked, he asked me one time, he said, to define Christianity in one word. If you had to define Christianity in one word, I go, faith, hope, love. But the greatest of these is love, gotcha. You know? That's actually in the Bible, in case you didn't know. Um, he, he said, actually, he, so here's how he defined it. He said, Christianity in one word, others. It took me a while to really think on that, and I don't think I even really fully got it until even just a few years ago. I heard another conference speaker say it this way. The main thing, Christians are concerned with so many things. Christians are concerned with so many things in the Bible, understanding the Bible. There are certain brands of Christianity that need the new revelation. What's God speaking right now? I want to prophesy something. There are others that are so concerned with that. I got to get my doctrine right. I got to get the theology right. We're concerned with so many things. But this conference speaker said, the main thing a Christian should be concerned with is learning how to love other people. And it sounds like what Jesus said. They came to Jesus one time and they're like, Jesus, what's the most important thing in all the law? Meaning the 613 laws, not the 10 commandments. What's the most important thing in all the law? And Jesus said, love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the second is like it. You can't separate these two. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets, he won up them. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Can't separate these things. Being involved in serving and loving other people. Philippians chapter two. This is one of my all-time favorite passages of scripture. This is the first chapter in the Bible I even memorized as a teenager. Philippians chapter two. Paul says, and he's writing this in prison, one of his last letters. He says, if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, and being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. What is Paul saying here to be like-minded, having the same love, being one accord? He's saying here unity here is the goal. And then he describes how to achieve this type of unity how to practice this type of unity, to do nothing out of selfish ambition. That's the first step in achieving this kind of oneness so that Christ is glorified, is to do nothing out of selfish ambition. In the flesh, we are often motivated by selfish ambition or conceit. Much of what we do is not motivated out of a love for others, but out of our own desire of advancement and promotion. Now, it's important to point out that Paul says selfish ambition because not all ambition is selfish. The selfish ambition is the problem. Let nothing be done through conceit. This is the second step. Conceit is thinking too highly of ourselves, having an excessive self-preoccupation. When we behave like that, we actually undermine and work against unity. This is why Jesus said, love God and love others, all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments because if everything you do is motivated out of these two things, you're gonna most likely do the right thing. It's when our motive is selfish that leads us into problems. In humility, consider others 
more significant than yourselves. This is so counterintuitive and counterculture now, and it even was more so then. In the, in the ancient Greek mindset, they considered humility and lowness of mind to be a fault, not a virtue. The pagan and secular idea of manhood was self-assertiveness, imposing one, <clears throat> excuse me, imposing one's will on others. Anyone who stooped to others only did so under compulsion. That's why this is so counterintuitive and so different. We follow God. We've, we're disciples of Jesus. We serve a different kingdom. That's why Jesus is looking, my kingdom is different. You wanna be great? You're so caught up in being great? You wanna be great? Be a servant. In my kingdom, the greatest is the least, right? This is what Jesus says. It's inverted, it's opposite. It's opposite what our culture around us tells us we should pursue. It's opposite often of even our own impulse. We wanna climb the corporate ladder. We want to, we're always thinking of upward mobility. What's my upward mobility? And I was drawn to this book. It's written by Henry Nouwen. Some of you know him as a great uh, professor and theologian, great Christian thinker. He wrote this book called The Selfless Way of Christ. But what drew me to the book was what it says underneath. It says downward mobility and the spiritual life. We're so caught up in upward mobility, as we serve a different kingdom. And the way to become great is to become least. It's a downward mobility. Are you comfortable with that? This is a difficult concept for our flesh. It's a difficult concept in the culture that we live in. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the great German theologian, in his book, The Cost of Discipleship, he said, the greatest thing in all the world is to become nothing so that Christ can become everything. Try to pray that prayer. I've tried it. I tried to pray it and I tried to mean it. But it's hard to mean it. God, make me nothing. I can even sound like I mean it, trying to convince myself that I mean it. But in my heart, deep down, what I'm really hoping is that I get credit for having prayed it, but I really still become something. (laughs) It's difficult. Henry Nouwen, in his book, he talks about this, that how we get so caught up in this idea of upward mobility, our society is characterized by it everywhere. And he says this, I'm just read you a couple little excerpts. He said, the problem is not the desire for development and progress as an individual or a community, but in making upward mobility itself a religion. Well, of course we would say, well, we don't, but do we? Here's how he describes it. In this religion, we believe that success means that God is with us and failure means he isn't. It means he's sinned. Think about it. When you see something really successful, you automatically think God's blessing them. We say that kind of stuff, right? And it reinforces this idea, this whole thing that we think that upward mobility is the goal and if that's what's happening, God is there and if someone's being demoted, maybe God's not with them when actually it's probably just the opposite. He uses Jesus as our own example. Indeed, the one who from the beginning was with God and who was God revealed himself in a small helpless child as a refugee in Egypt, as an obedient adolescent, as an inconspicuous adult, as a penitent disciple of the baptizer, as a preacher from Galilee followed by some simple fishermen, as a man who ate with sinners and talked with strangers, as an outcast, a criminal, a threat to his people. He moved from power to powerlessness, from greatness to smallness, from success to failure, from strength to weakness, from glory to humility. The whole life of Jesus of Nazareth was a life in which all upward mobility was resisted. That is very powerful. As fully devoted followers of Jesus, we fully devote ourselves to humility and to serving others, not to looking to be served, not to make our name great. See, listen, if I consider you above me and you consider me above you, an amazing thing happens. We will have a community where no one is looked up to, where everyone is looked up to and no one is looked down on. That's the goal. And Paul says, let each of you look not only to his own interest, yes, you gotta look to your own interests, but let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. Why is this so important? Why do we value others so much? Why is this throughout scripture? Why does Jesus say this, that we should be a servant, to be the greatest, to be a servant? Why is this so significant? 
I think to really understand this, we have to look at Genesis in the creation account. In Genesis, the Bible says this in Genesis 1, then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Now, when you read the creation account, God speaks to it. God speaks to everything that he creates. Let there be this. Let there be. But when he, speaks, when he creates man, he speaks to himself. Let us make man in our image after our likeness. So every single person that you meet, every single one, carries that image. That's why when you get to Exodus and God gives the Ten Commandments to Israel, as they've now been delivered out of bondage, out of slavery, they've been set free from Egypt, they're there at the base of Mount, Kil uh, Mount not Mount Kilimanjaro. <laughs> I was talking to somebody earlier about Pikes Peak and Mount Kilimanjaro, it got stuck in my head. At the base of Mount Sinai. Moses is up praying and the children of Israel down there with Aaron and Moses is up there so long and they're like, okay, God deliver us, but what does God look like? Who is God? Show us what God is like, Aaron. We wanna worship God. Their impulse is actually okay, but they're missing the bigger picture. They had come out of a culture where there were lots of idols, lots of gods. They had an idol for this God and an idol for this God, an idol for this God, and now they're going, okay, well, show us who our God is. So Aaron makes his golden calf. Moses gets all ticked off. God tells them not to do that. God tells them in Exodus chapter 20, he says, you shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Why does God tell them not to make any carved image? Don't do that. And the reason for that is, and in fact, in Hebrew, the words there in Genesis and in Exodus, sometimes it's translated in Exodus, idols, right? And if you summarize the Ten Commandments, that would be the one that you would say, no false idols. And, but that word is actually the same Hebrew word. God says don't do that because he already did. In the context of that culture, and probably even still today in some religions, if you have an idol, this is the image of your God. And the way that you treat that idol is the way that you treat God. If you walked into the temple and this was their idol and you knock it over and you roll it over there in the dirt and you throw it in the corner, you would have dishonored their God because that's the image of their God. God is saying to us, and I want you to really understand this, you're the idol of God. You're not the object of God's worship or anybody else's worship. You're the image. An idol is an image of God. God says, that's you. Let us make man in our image. You're it. God says, don't make this false idol because I already made it. You're it. That's why throughout scripture, you cannot separate loving God and loving other people, even when they challenge Jesus to do it. He can't separate the two. Later in the New Testament, it says, you cannot love God whom you have not seen if you don't love your brother whom you have seen. You cannot separate the two. It's why Jesus would get so ticked off when people would show favoritism to the rich but mistreat the poor. Because regardless of their earthly possessions, they carry equally the image of God. It's why he was showing us the way, serve each other. What I'm doing when I honor you, when I serve you, is I'm serving God. You carry his image. Even if you don't know it, even if you don't understand it, even for the person that's far away from God and has no idea and no desire to have any knowledge of God, even they carry his image, and when I serve them, I serve him. That's why we're talking today about serving, and why we want everybody involved here for sure in a serve team as we serve each other so we can fulfill the mission of Christ that he's given us, but also just generally in our lives, having this attitude that was also in Christ Jesus. This is what it says in verse five. Have this mind among yourselves, when some translations say have this attitude, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. What you do by serving others 
demonstrates that you value others and it honors the Lord. When I was a teenager, and I've shared this before, when I was a teenager, my mom well, was raising me and my sister you know, by herself and we lived in an apartment over on the south side of Jacksonville. And you know, my mom's not here today. She's watching online. She's not feeling well. Uh, and so I can say whatever I want because she's not here today. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. But you know how it happens as you're a teenager, you kind of sometimes butt heads with your parents. And my mom was the one that was there. And even though when you meet her, she's so sweet and she's so, you know, she could be really stubborn. <laughs> just kidding, I'm the one that can be stubborn. She is actually very sweet. And, uh, but even with somebody that's very sweet, you can butt heads at times, right? You can have conflict. And so there were times that I, that would happen and I would get irritated and frustrated and I would, I would be disrespectful to her. But as I really began to embrace my faith, as I began to grow in my own faith and read the Bible, I read in Romans chapter 13 that all authority is given by God. And the way that I respond to that authority is the way that I respond to God. Now, it doesn't mean I always agree with authority, but it means that I'm, I respect and I can honor. I can disagree and still be respectful. I can disagree and still show honor. And so God was showing me that my mom, that, that I was actually dishonoring him by disrespecting her. And so here's what I learned. If I would honor her, I honor him. So there were times in, the, in my eye of faith that I would look like this to God, and in my heart I would say, I'm gonna honor you. My mom just happened to be standing in the way. And she, and then, but then that puts her in a position to be a conduit of God's blessing back to me, right? It's about showing, it's about honoring God through that. The same is true in serving this way. That when I, when I serve you, even if you don't understand it or receive it, I'm honoring the Lord through that. I'm serving him. When we serve each other, we're serving him. That's why this is so important. Colossians, Paul says to the Colossians, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. It's the Lord Christ you're serving. When you serve each other, it's the Lord Christ you're serving. When you care for the least of these, the broken, the overlooked, the isolated, the, the ones that have been marginalized, you honor the Lord. That's one reason that so many of our ministries exist. It's one reason Special Nation, our ministry to families with disabilities exists. Because we believe that they carry that image of God, they have gifts, and they have something to give. If you were here uh, several weeks ago, one of, our, one of the teenagers from Special Nation, Matthew Layton, came in during communion liturgy, and he led us in the Lord's Prayer. Now, Matthew has autism, and he has nonverbal autism. His parents had never heard him speak until he continued to hear and learn the communion liturgy, and they heard him say the Lord's Prayer. It was the first time they heard him speaking. Each time they get together, they can't wait to get to that point so they can hear their son speaking. He came in here and he led us all in the Lord's Prayer. Next Sunday is Second Sunday Special Praise when the Special Nation team will be gathering for a special worship service. One of the students that's in there, and I hope I'm not giving too much away because I know they wanted to be a little bit of a surprise, one of the students, Jacob Yeager, uh, who's also a teenager and was nonverbal until he learned how to communicate through typing. And sometimes with autism, depending on the severity, there is, part of what happens is there, there's a disconnect in their motor skills and what's going on in their brain. And they don't understand necessarily where they are in space. That's why they might run into a wall or it seems they might knock something over. It's not because they're trying to knock something over. It's, a lot of it has to do with that. And so in facilitated communication, they bring them in and they help orient them to where they are, sometimes by giving them resistance on their hands so they can type, and then ultimately they progress from there to just putting their hand on their shoulder to help orient them, and then they can type. Jacob is actually gonna be sharing a message in Second Sunday Special Praise next Sunday, that a sermon that he was able to write out because he's learned this, and one of the things he says is that he was trapped in a world of silence and loneliness until he learned how to, to communicate this way. In fact, next Sunday, 
I'm hoping that I'll be able to show you a portion of that, a video of that in our service here. And you'll see how God is using him. Everybody has something to give in some way. We all have something to contribute. And we all, have, we, all, we all have needs that will be met from each other. We also have gifts that God will use to meet the needs of others. We have a saying around here, every member a minister, every task important. My job is not more important than anyone else's. It has different responsibilities and it might get different recognition, but it isn't more important. Every member is a minister. When you come to faith in Jesus, you're a new creation and you're given the ministry of reconciliation. We all have a role. And we all do this together to accomplish a goal. Paul uses the human body as that illustration, the hand, the foot, the eye, all doing different things, but to accomplish one goal. Some parts get more attention. Actually, you know, we pay more attention to the parts that aren't important. Some of you, not me, some of you spent a lot of time on your hair this morning. And your hair doesn't actually do anything to improve the quality of your life. Well, it might, I don't know. What can I say? But, but you know what, you'll, you'll spend all that time on your hair and then go eat garbage. Why'd I get off on that? <laughs> I don't even know. Let me, let, me, let me pull it back in here. It all matters. In 1 Kings chapter 10, the queen of Sheba is a seeker. The queen of Sheba is hearing about the fame and wisdom of Solomon and she wants to come and find out and test him and see if it's true. And in 1 Kings 10, it says that when she got there and she saw the palace that he had built and she saw the food that had been prepared and the people that were serving and, the, and, the, and all the attendants around and when she heard the wisdom of Solomon, she was overwhelmed. It doesn't say when she heard his wisdom. It was all of it together. Everything is contributing for that moment. I wanna show you a short video and then I'm gonna come back up and wrap up with just a few verses and get us ready for communion. But I wanna show you a few videos, but here's a few. (laughs) I wanna show you a video (laughs) with some people that are involved in serving. And I want you to consider how and where God might want you to get involved serving. And maybe this isn't your church, maybe you're visiting, maybe you're visiting online, but I wanna encourage you, wherever is your church, to get involved serving. Like Eastman said, serving Christians are happy Christians. There are, so there's, well anyway, watch this video. Hi, my name is Elaine Johnson. Everybody calls me EJ. And I've been serving here at Redeemer for almost 10 years. Uh, howdy y'all. My name is Austin Edwards. I've been serving at Redeemer for two years now. My name's Trinity and I've been serving at Redeemer for about seven years. My name is Kevin Acevedo. Uh, I've been serving uh, in one way or another at Redeemer since uh, about 2004, 2005, somewhere in that ballpark. I've had a ton of opportunities to serve here at Redeemer, actually, from uh, music and production. Cafe Okoa, I've served in production. Primarily as a member of our worship team. Serving some of the homeless populations here with uh, Dr. Julie McKay. With the youth. The student ministry and special events had opportunities with the Fall Festival. Um, As well as the live stream, so shameless plug here. Um, We need camera people. The the, the music ministry has given me this opportunity to deepen my relationship. It is my musical prayer that I hope impacts our congregation, impacts our guests, but I can certainly tell you that it has strengthened my relationship with God. Prayer for me was always kind of odd. And then as I started having to do announcements, realizing it's not just gonna be me personally praying and having a conversation, I'm gonna have to do that in front of a lot of people. It was actually kind of great in that sense because it forced me to pray more just during the week. So one, one of the things um, early on in our marriage that uh, one of our pastors told us, he really encouraged everybody to serve together. And as a result of that, and I'm really grateful for Redeemer because they really gave us the space to actually involve our family. So our kids have been involved since they were little. And, um, you know, it's pretty cool now to see my kids as adults who are now uh, coming into their own thing and volunteering and helping out in, um, in areas. I serve in student ministry because it's so impactful to see the next generation go closer to the Lord. It forces me to grow closer in my relationship to the Lord. Um, so I can help walk these students through difficult times. 
um, and I get to be there with them and the good times too. And that's what serving has enabled me to create is this extended amazing family that when there's something to celebrate, this is who you want to reach out to. When there's moments of trial, it's having those members of my church family surround me that I've gotten to know so much deeper through serving. Well, our society focuses, especially my generation focuses on self-love and self-fulfillment, but that's not our goal and that's not our purpose. We're coming together every sun Sunday to glorify God and to worship Him and to be serving others. People think that they, that they aren't capable or that they're not good enough. I think a lot of people think, even though I'm saved, this this other person, they're, they're better than me. I mean, they, they serve because they're like better. That's not true at all. <laughs> like we're all saved and then empowered by grace to do whatever we're called to. So for those of you that um, that have been in, in a spot in, in your lives where you were serving before, you were either burnt out or you uh, were offended by somebody's actions, you need to re-engage. You need to uh, leave the past exactly where it's at in the past. We're all called to be servants and there is huge uh, fulfillment in, in doing that. One of our church distinctives is that we are intentionally generational and I have seen that play out as I have served. There's no distinction. We are all children of God. I think that's part of what serving is. It's anybody can do it. Because it's not really you that's doing it. It's God doing it through you. And he can do anything. Howdy, howdy, howdy. <laughs> so is something about... It's, pre it's pretty good. I've, but that's okay, you can cut that out, right? You know, you can even say... This is why I don't do camera stuff. <laughs> Beep. On your way out in the Ahern Center, there'll be some tables set up and you can find out more about different areas you can get involved in. There's so many. We've got a sheet out there that you can also take home with you that lists on both sides the different areas that you can get involved serving. Some things are every week, some things are once a month, some things are only around when special events happen. There's lots of options. Pray about it and look for some way to get involved using your gifts. Paul says in the Galatians, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then. And do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. You're free. Stand firm in that. Don't get under legalism. And don't even let me today encouraging you to serve. Don't, don't let that become something that's legalistic to you. I'm not trying to manipulate anybody or make you feel guilty. I want you involved serving because I know you have something to give and I know you'll receive something from it. I know you'll be more fulfilled and you'll help fulfill the ministry and mission that God has called us to, but I don't want you to feel manipulated or tricked or pressured. You're free. Stand firm. And do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. You who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ and have fallen away from grace. When we try to get back under the law, or get legalistic about something, this is what happens. For Christ Jesus, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircum uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. You, my brothers, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge your sinful nature, rather serve one another in love. The entire law, is summed up in a single command, love your neighbor as yourself. Every person we meet is created in the image of God. We honor him when we honor them, we serve him when we serve them. A simple act of serving can tear down barriers and open hearts. A kind word goes a long way. You never know what somebody's struggling with when they roll in here on a Sunday morning. They may, they may look like they got it all together, there may be something going on underneath or behind, this, behind the scenes that you don't understand. You just want to love them and serve them. Join a serve team and make a difference. And you will be surprised at the difference that it makes in you as well. Would you guys stand with me and let's prepare for communion here in just a moment. <clears throat> Listen, there are people 
in this congregation, but there are people in this community who are isolated and who are lonely, people who are marginalized and overlooked, people who have suffered loss and they're hurting, people who are struggling financially, even though it might look like they're not, you don't know what's going on. And we have an opportunity to minister to them, every one of us, every member a minister, and every opportunity to serve matters and makes a difference. <clears throat> We're gonna come to communion and uh, we do this every Sunday. This is the gospel. This is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. This reminds us that we are in right standing with God because of what Jesus did for us, not because we've earned it and we certainly don't deserve it. It's about what he did. So we come back to this every single week and it reorients us to that reality. But the Bible does encourage us to bow our hearts in the time of self-examination. And that's what we wanna do is we wanna pray a prayer. We're just gonna examine our own hearts. You be honest with yourself. You know what's going on in your life this week. And we're gonna confess our sin because he says, if we confess, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We're just gonna all admit it. <laughs> We've all sinned. And this is good news for us because if you confess, you're cleansed. And then we're gonna pray a prayer of salvation, just embracing Jesus as our Lord and Savior. And then Pastor David's gonna come and lead us in communion. Would you bow your hearts? And I'm gonna lead you in a prayer, but you just, you pray this, you repeat after me, but you pray it and you mean it yourself. Let's pray this together. Heavenly Father, I confess that I have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. Have mercy on me and forgive me through your son, my savior. Lord Jesus, I believe you lived on this earth you died for my sin. You rose and now live. I yield to you. Be my Lord. The Holy Spirit, fill me with power and passion to follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. And we pray that every week, and every week I mean it. And it's a reorientation for me. But if you prayed that, and it's the first time you prayed it and actually meant it, we would love to know that. And there's a communication card in the seat in front of you. If you just let us know that and on your way out, drop that in one of the offering receptacles. We just would love to pray with you and be able to encourage you, maybe provide some resources. But let us know if you prayed that for the first time. You may be seated. Everyone has something to give, and, and Pastor Sean encouraged us with that, with scriptural reasons. Uh, in back, way back in another lifetime, several of us in this room sat under who he mentioned, Pastor Costa Deer, and heard a teaching on serving others. And he, opposite from Pastor Sean, he had 49 reasons why it's biblical to serve one another. And so I'm going to get that out for you, that teaching, but not today, not today. Someone there said, at the end, they said, I wonder why there's not 50, and everybody around put their hand over his mouth and said, no, we're done. It was two and a half <laughs> hours later. So there are many, many reasons to serve, and as Pastor Sean said, when you go out, you have opportunity at the tables. We want to invite all of you to join us as we come to this table and receive our communion if you're one of us or if you're a guest here if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ then we invite you to participate if you didn't get a cup when you came in raise your hand keep it up high and they will come and find you as they come down the aisles the Lord be with you let's pray together father we pray this morning for the peace of Jerusalem that there would be safety and blessing within the gates and walls of your holy city and Father, we thank you. We thank you that you loved us so much that even when our hearts were against you and we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, in your great mercy, you sent your only son, Jesus Christ, to live and to die as one of us, to take the burden of our sin and our sickness upon himself to reconcile us to you once and for all. 
As we break bread together today, we ask that you'd put us in remembrance of that sacrifice and give us a greater understanding of the covenant that we now have with you. We ask that you'd sanctify this bread and this cup to be for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ and sanctify us also that we might faithfully serve you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. On the night that our Lord Jesus was handed over to suffering and death, he took bread and he blessed it. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, ruler of the universe brings forth bread from the earth. Then he broke it. He gave it to them. He said, take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup and again, he blessed it. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, ruler of the universe, who creates the fruit of the vine. Then he gave it to them. He said, drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Whenever you do this, do it in remembrance of me. The Bible teaches us that as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he returns. Let's all pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The body of Christ broken for you, the blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. I invite you to partake of your elements. If you're watching with us at home, you join us now. After you've had a moment of reflection there in your seat, we'll invite you to stand. We'll sing one last song. Our prayer teams will be up here to pray with you after that. In the pressing, you are making new wine. In the soil, I now surrender, you are breaking new ground. So I yield to you and to your careful hand. When I trust you, I don't need to understand. Make me your vessel. Make me an offering. Make me whatever you want me to be. I came here with nothing, but all you have given me, Jesus, bring me. the crushing, in the pressing, you are making new wine. In the soil I now surrender, you are breaking new ground. 
you made it to church because it's true serving Christians are happy Christians somebody shout I'm happy just say I'm happy that's because you're serving now if you haven't plugged into any department because we've got tons of departments here on the way out Pat, I'm just gonna remind you please in the Epic Center the a earn Epic Center walk out there and you're gonna see a table actually several tables and there are all these little cards up there with these little things if you would just walk up and if there's an area you might want more information about uh, just grab one of those cards fill it out and put it in the little basket now when you fill that card out understand you're not saying okay I'm committing 10 years of my life to uh, this ministry that's that's not what you're doing you're just saying I want more information about how to get involved what would that entail and then you'll know the Holy Spirit will show you what you need to do is you get more information about that so that's on the way out don't think you'll be threatened that you're going to be stuck in this thing for years if you sign that little card that's not the way it works it's for more information so be sure to do that I, I encourage you also if you're here today and you need prayer for anything and you need God to do a miracle in your life our prayer teams are up here one on each side of us and we'd love to pray with you and if you're watching on the internet we're so thankful that you're with us we encourage you to do this if you need prayer your family needs prayer something needs to happen I encourage you to push that little prayer button someone will be on we're gonna pray with you we're believing God for miracles in this place now I'm gonna release the power of God this morning and I want you to receive what God has for you this is the blessings that you're gonna walk in the Bible tells us the blessings of God come on us and they overtake us is there anybody this morning ready for an overtaking blessing from God anybody like that you're at the right place I want you to shut your eyes I want you to lift your hands up in the air receive this blessing from the Lord the Lord bless you and keep you the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace now go in peace to love and serve the Lord Amen. You guys have an awesome week. Be sure to sign up out there.